All right, so now we're going to do the cam for this derby car blank. All right, so we've done all of the CAD. So we've drawn this, this car. All right, so we've done all of the CAD. So we've drawn this, this car. So, you know, just kind of recapping, there is one of the sketches. That's the original sketch. All right, that's the sketch for the holes right there. And then, of course, you've got the, the two sketches on the side for the axles and wheels and all that good stuff to mount to. <clears throat> now, we've, uh, we've got, uh, in my opinion, the complicated side done. All, right? uh, all we've got left to do is, uh, is the cam. All right? So, first thing we're going to do, once we get all of the CAD done, and once we know that it's, that it's good, Go ahead and save it. Okay, make sure, and hopefully you got it saved from the last video. All right, and then we've got the manufacturer tab over here. Now, I wanna go right here to design, and I want you to look at all these tools up here. And when I go to manufacturer, watch how they change. All right, everything changed. Now, mine looks different than yours. All right, and let me explain that. Uh, that is there because I don't know what I'm doing shooting these videos. All right, um, just full disclosure. So I just got done shooting this uh, this video, um, and I was like, I don't know, an hour and a half deep into it or something, and I realized the first 20 minutes you couldn't see any of the windows and things like that that I had popped up. Um, I, as you can imagine, uh, that that uh, that bothered me. And, uh, and I, I can't, I can't release something like that, obviously. So anyway, I'm going to try to edit this all together to where it looks seamless. Um, but who knows? All right. So this was done at the end of the video. All right. So that's what we're going to be getting to, obviously with not all of that red, it's going to look something like that. So that's going to come at the end of the video, but keep in mind that I'm doing this later and I'm going to splice it into the front and I say that like it's going to be easy. I have no idea what I'm doing. I know how to cut metal. I don't know how to make videos. All right. So just bear with me. All right. So um, I'm going to turn this setup off. Maybe I'm not. I'm going to have to suppress it probably. All right. So that setup is... Not suppressed. Yeah, it is suppressed. Okay. All right. So when you get over here, we're going to do a new setup. So we're going to act like none of this stuff exists. Okay. Now I didn't want to like delete anything and, and, and you know, cause any sort of confusion there. Um, but uh, one quick thing. Go away. All right. Nobody likes Internet Explorer. All right. So we, um, we are going to act like this setup is not here. So we're just going to start from scratch. All right. So you've got two ways you can get to the setups. You can either go here and go new setup, or you can right click here. I'm sorry. You can right click here, go new setup. Now, why do we need a setup? What is a setup? All right. The setup is going to be the heart and soul of your program. That's, that's the heart and soul of your, your job. All right. That's where you're going to dictate where you want the origin, uh, how you want the part oriented, um, how much extra material you've got, uh, all that sort of stuff, what you're gonna name your program. So it's kind of got the bones of your program. All right? Obviously very, very important. If you uh, don't get this step right, then you're just gonna stumble the rest of the time. All right, so this is um, probably the, the more um, susceptible to error, I guess you would say. Um, so just make sure that you're paying attention, uh, you know, throughout this and you'll, you will be fine. All right, so I'm gonna go new setup, okay? Now yours probably says setup, semicolon, whatever, setup one. Mine says setup five because I've done this a couple of times, right? So don't sweat that. Now, <clears throat> we're not going to worry with machine, 
All right. So we're, we're in pretty much the format that we're going to go is we're going to work left to right, top to bottom. All right. So we're going to start here, work down. When we get done, go to this one, work down. When we get done, go to this one. All right. And that's pretty much how fusion works, right? So we're going to be milling. We're not going to be turning, um, cutting. We're not, you know, running a 3D printer or anything. We're going to be milling. Now, uh, let me let me circle back. The machine, that is good if you're doing like really complicated um, five axis work, where if you're doing stuff where, um, you know, you may have a, a fixture, you know, pop out of the machine or something like that. You can build your machine in and you can let it function like like show move the table move the head move all that stuff to show if there's going to be any like catastrophes all right a normal three axis milling uh that's typically not necessary um it's cool all right you know it, it's 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 like a bell and whistle that you can add on uh it's cool but it's not really needed unless you get into um you know five axis trunnion work um you know a lot of fancy fixtures and things but for what we're doing, we don't really need it. All right, operation type, milling. We already discussed that. Uh, orientation. So this is where we're going to set up our WCS, our work coordinate system. Now, for my orientation, that is going to dictate which way these arrows are pointing. All right, so you see Y, Z, X. Now, the when you're standing at a machine and you are pause you one second <clears throat> okay uh, so I had to pause it there uh, you probably didn't realize that but anyway uh, when you're standing at the machine like when you're facing the machine all right X positive is to your right Y positive is away from you and Z positive is straight up and down all right not straight up and down it's straight up all right that's Z positive and obviously, negative is the opposite ways. All right. So if we want to machine this with this short side, see how this side's a little bit shorter? All right. If we want that off to the right, then X is pointing the right way. You see that? Z is not and Y is not. Okay. So we need to get that orientation correct. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select, instead of letting it decide for itself, and because what this is doing is it's taking its best guess based on how we drew it. I'm going to select Z axis and X axis. So for Z, I'm just going to click anything that's perfectly vertical. Like that. All right, you see how it made my Z do like that? Okay, so my X, I'm going to do that. Okay, now, believe it or not, we're close. It doesn't look like it, but we're close. Now, once you get, all right, hang on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip down a second, and I'll explain why here in a second, here in a minute. So I'm going to select box point. Okay, now, the reason I needed to do that is because if I did any more clicking than over here, it gets really, really confused. All right, so I needed to, to deselect out of one of these boxes, okay? All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna kind of manipulate these a little bit, all right? I know I want my X pointing the other way, so I'm simply going to click the arrow. I know that I want my Z pointing up and down, so I'm simply going to click the arrow, all right? And what that does is it just, it reverses it. That's all it does. Okay. So it, it when you click the arrow, it reverses. All right. So that is correct. I've got my X, Y, and Z all pointing in the right direction. Now that moves on to where do we want our location? Like where, where, own this part do we want our origin all right so you've got a couple of options you've got 
model origin, which is where we drew, like, you know, wherever the origin was that we, when we drew this part, which was in the center, okay, then that's where it's going to put it. Or selected point, which, you know, you can like select that, you know, let's say I wanted that to be the origin. Or let's say that I wanted, you know, come on, come on, help me out here. All right, it's not working for me, but we want we want to use model box point. Oh, it's going to do me like this now. Okay. I see. It's going to freeze up and everything else. So sometimes when it gets kind of wonky like that, you got to click out of it and click back in it. And you see my, you see my stuff, my work coordinate system got, got screwy there too. So bear with me while I work back through this. All right. So z-axis here x-axis here box point flip my z now we're good okay so just just be careful see that's showing nothing but hey I, i'm good with it it's right we're gonna roll with it so um now Make absolute, absolutely certain that you do model box point and not stock box point. All right, let me show you why. Come on. All right, so if I do stock box point, it's going to put the origin in the Z on my stock. All right, that is not at all what I want. All right, I want my Z0 to be the top of my part. All right, make sure that you guys understand the difference between stock and part. All right, they are not the same thing, okay? So, you know, you may touch off on the top of your stock, but you may be 10,000s off of your part, all right? So just, just make sure that you think about that, all right? Stock is not the same as your part. <clears throat> now, um, so, you know, make sure that you've got model box point. And when we get to the next screen, I'm gonna carry that to extremes just to, uh, to kind of show you, all right? The next tab, oh, well, all right, so model and fixture. Um, those are used if you have like a big complex, you know, assembly of parts, you know, like let's say instead of you drawing something with a fixture, you drew it as an assembly, all right? Then you can import the entire assembly in here, well not import it, you can open the entire assembly in here and only select what you want to machine, all right? And the same thing with the fixture. If you've got a couple of parts on the screen at the same time, the computer sees those as bodies. All right? It doesn't know what you want to machine. All right? So you have to tell it, I want to machine this part and not these other six, whatever that looks like. So uh, we're not going to be using much of those, uh, really any of those. All right? But if you had a vice uh, built in, if you had a fixture built in, this is where you would need to select um, you know, what you want to cut, what you don't want to cut. Okay. All right. Then we're going to go over here to stock. Now for mode. Um, so it defaults to relative stock size, which I, I think is kind of crazy, but we as machinists work off of just normal numbers. All right. When you go over to the material rack, you're not going to find a piece of 2.04 by 1.83 aluminum laying there. All right, it's, it's not going to happen. All right, you may find a piece of two by two. You may find a piece of two by three. All right, we, we work on normal numbers. So what this has done, what relative size box has done, 
is it took the size of my part and it added a certain amount to each side. So it added 40 thousandths to each side, okay? And then it added 40 thousandths to the top, zero to the bottom. And you know, let me just show you what that does, right? See, I added one inch to the bottom. You know, let's add two inches to the top. Let's add two inches to each side, right? That's what all that does. All right, so it, it defaulted at 0 .040 and 00. zero. But what we do here, we almost always work off of a fixed size block. Okay? You know, we're not working off of castings or anything like that. We're working off of just raw stock material. So this material, 7.25. All right, the model position is center. So we want to cut equal amounts off of each side. If I didn't, then I could do this. So I could say offset from left or right. And, you know, offset it 10 thousandths to where there's only 10 thousandths material. And the rest of it's shooting out the other side. All right. I'm a fan of center in both the X and Y. Okay. This material is two inches in the Y. All right, so here's our finished stock sizes here. 7.25 long two by two. Now I've got this piece of material sitting on my desk right here. That, that's, that's it. Seven and a quarter long two by two. All right. Um, now, what I'm going to do is show you real quick while we're, while we're right here. I'm going to make this three inches and I'm going to offset from the top and do five thousandths. Uh, let's do two inches, whatever. Well, wait a minute. One inch makes a little more sense. So no, I'm, I'm carrying it to extremes here. I don't want you to do this. All right. I'm, I'm just carrying it to extremes. So, <clears throat> When you look at this, my origin is still on my part, right? Because I selected model box point. Had I selected stock box point, look at where it's coming from. So in other words, my face mill is going to cut to Z negative one inch. It's not going to cut to Z zero. It's going to cut to Z negative one inch. All right? These ringed holes that are supposed to be uh, a quarter inch deep, they're going to have to ring to minus 1.25. So it's going to make the code look really, really weird. So when you're looking at your print versus the code, it's going to look extremely weird. All right. We don't want to do that. We want it to look like the number straight off the print. So again, model box point, you want it to come off the model. All right. So stock, I'm going to carry this back to two inches say center now post process this is where you're going to give it the name whatever and you can name this whatever you want I almost always do it off the print number like the drawing number uh, this is DCC ADC 000 so I'm just gonna do the uh, numerical value of ADC uh, 143 and O1, you know, O, O, Op1, okay? And this is going to be ADC, Op1, ring holes, all right? This is where you would select down here. If you wanted this to be G55 or G56 or G57, this is where you would select that, okay? If you wanted multiple different work offsets, you would do that here. You know, let's say you had a plate with a bunch of different parts in it and you wanted them all to be different offsets. All right, that's where you would do that, all right? Okay, I hope that wasn't a big deal. All right, and then we're just going to go 
All right, so that alarm that it just told me, it just gave me, said that I did not select a model. So it took its best guess and it was right. Okay, so our setup is done. All right, if you want to edit that, you can always just right click, edit, and there it is. All right, you can always come right back in here and change things. Okay, so it's always right there. All right, I'm going to see, I'm going to say ADC stock prep um, after video mess up. Okay, so that was the one I did before I messed up the video. This is the one I'm doing after. Okay, so once you get your setup done, you can click on it and it shows you everything. So the first thing we need to do is add a face milling cycle in here. All right. Now, this is where I lost you on the video. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started on this, and then we're going to splice into the new video. And hopefully, it's going to be like a Steven Spielberg production, and you won't even notice. So, let's go right here. We're going to go New Operation. So, I'm going to right-click. Right, let's see what happens. Yeah, if you left-click, not it just nothing but if you right click you're going to go right here to new operation 2d milling uh, when you select and tool. Face. okay right here this is what pops up right and i imagine before it looked like i was just waving around doing nothing um so right here when you select this if you select sample tools you've got some pre-built tools in here you know like if you want to go to hole making all right you got a bunch of drills here if you want to go into turning well of course we're not in turning but if you wanted to go into like probing and and you know whole uh milling all right milling's got a bunch of them probing didn't have anything cutting didn't have anything well other than water jet laser laser and plasma but Milling has got a bunch. You can filter them down by using these. Like if you want to only look at ball mills, you can do that. If you want to only look at bull nose end mills, you can do that. Um, but this is your um, sample library. Right? You can always grab something from in here and make it what you want. Like you can grab it and modify it. Um, but me personally, I've always liked just starting from scratch. All right, it's just easier in my opinion. Um, so we're going to go over here, and I want you to notice something. So when I'm in sample tools, it will not let me add anything to this folder. Okay, the, the new tool selection is disabled, in other words. All right, so... If I click here, it is still disabled. But if I click here, it enables it. All right, and I'm making a big deal about that because I, when I first started on Fusion, I was pulling my hair out with that. But you cannot add to an existing library. So Fusion, you know, Autodesk made this library. All right, and they don't want us messing around in it. They don't want us changing things and, and the mani manipulating stuff, all right? We can pull from it and modify it, but we cannot modify anything in this library, all right? I hope that makes sense, all right? And I cannot create a tool library within an operation. I can create it within a project, all right? So click on your project, go new tool, all right, we're going to create a face mill. All right, we're going to start here, work over. So my description is I'm just going to keep this simple for the uh, for the sake of time. All right, you know, I'm not going to go in here and put the, the vendor part number and product ID and hyperlink to all that stuff, all right, which you can, and that's what I would advise you to do if you were creating like a true tool crib. All right, I would advise you to put the vendor part numbers and the product ID and all the all the cutting data, everything else there. All right, then we're going to go over to cutter, face mill, 
All right, clockwise spindle rotation, it's a right hand cutter. All right, number of flutes, that's gonna be four. Most of them we have are four. That is carbide. Now, this right here doesn't do anything. It doesn't drive anything. All right, but if you can change it just to kind of make you feel a little bit better, it's whatever. So two inch face mill. The shaft diameter is not a big deal for what we're doing. This is more to like show you potential crashes. All right, so I want you to imagine that you're doing some kind of really crazy part where you've got to put, um, you know, the, the, the tool in places where it's, uh, where it's gonna be a tight fit. All right, um, this is when creating, you know, the, the overall length and length below hold or all that, that's when all that comes into play. All right, but for what we're doing, just normal three axis milling, it's, it's not uh, absolutely necessary, okay? All right, um, so shoulder length, right? And it gives you a nice little diagram of what it is that defaults to 10 millimeters, just, just so you know. You'll see that number pop up a whole lot, uh, 3937. All right, and all that is is 10 millimeters. Um, all right, now my flute length, I'm just going to set that to like a quarter inch. All right, and the reason I do that is it will show me if I accidentally take too much. So, you know, if, if I've got this set to, you know, 0.375, whatever, and I try to go in and take a 3 8 pass, all right, then on the computer, it's just going to look like it cuts it, all right? But if I, if, you know, if I try to take more than a quarter inch pass, then I, I, I want it to, I want it to alert and, and show me a crash, all right? Now, the tools we have down there, uh, the, the face mills, we do have a little bit of a corner radius. Uh, I would just put maybe like a 20 on it. And then we do have 45 degree inserts. Okay, doesn't so much look like a face mill, but that's all the information the computer needs to do what it does. All right, so shaft, don't need to put anything for there. Holder, don't need to put anything for there, for that rather. All right, cutting data. All right, so I'm gonna spin this at a thousand surface feet and I'm gonna let it calculate. Okay, now, this this kind of um, area right here where it says ramp spindle speed so it's it's giving you the option to either increase or decrease the spindle speed when you're ramping all right now that may sound like nothing but when you need it it's nice to have it there all right so I always just match this and um, before Fusion did the last update, it was really easy to change like this this function. Right, you see that FX right there? Um, you can you can change the functions inside of inside of inside of uh, Fusion where where it gets its numbers and how it manipulates them for you. All right, you can you can change those and and correct those and make them fit what you want to uh, want to do. And actually, I can't move my mouse, but I'm hoping you can see where it says parameter name, tool ramp spindle speed. So we can change that parameter, okay? Um, and we're not going to do that now. This is, you know, one of your, y'all are just getting started in CAD CAM. We're not going to go changing parameters and stuff now. Um, so our feed per tooth, we're going to go about five, Okay. And our ramp feed rate, see that? I'm just gonna put that about 20, some something like that. Okay. So we're gonna be spending 1,910 RPM, feeding at 38.2 inches a minute. All right. And if that seems excessive to you, then change that to three, whatever. All right. I'm gonna stick with five. All right. And. Everything else looks pretty good. No need to change any of this stuff. And post-processor. Okay, so this is gonna be tool number one, length offset number one, tool diameter one. All right, we're not gonna be using cutter comp with a face mill, uh, not right now anyway. All right, so um, you don't really need to know this, but 
those all change together. So if I was to change this to two, everything changes together. All right, and if you needed to alter that, you would have to change the parameters, okay? And right, I'm guessing that just shows you that it's function driven, like parameter driven. Okay, now the comment. This is what's gonna show inside the program. All right, so I'm just gonna say two inch face mill. Over here, that's what's gonna show in your tool crib. Over here, that's what's gonna show as your comment in the, yeah, see it says a textual comment for the tool. The comment is typically included in the post-processed output, okay? And then accept. And then we're gonna select that tool. You see all this stuff auto-populated for us, all the speeds and feeds. We're going to come over here, stock selection. All right, most of the time, it will it will pick it for you. All right, so you don't you don't have to do anything. So we're going to see what happens when I do nothing. All right, heights for a face meal, you really don't need to change any of this. All right, heights is going to come into play here in the next couple tools. All right, passes. So tolerance that I can almost assure you that that doesn't mean what you think it means. If you hover over it, um, I encourage you to read this because it is really, really good content. All right, I'm gonna let you uh, do that on your own time. But tolerance is not what we think of as like print tolerance. It's tolerance to a circle or a circular path, okay? Pass direction, we're going to go zero. I'll show you what that means here in a second. Pass extension. How much do you want to extend out beyond the part? All right. And for step over, I like to make this a normal number, like um, 1.5, 1.75, something like that. It always, you know, uh, All right, so goes to something weird. Um, Oh, hang on, I just changed the default. It always goes to something weird, some like 92% of the face mail or something. But anyway, I like that to be a normal number. All right, now, if you want to only climb mill, you can do that. So let's say you've got multiple passes on the same block. If you want to only climb mill, select that. If you want to only conventional mill, select that. If you don't care, select that. It'll go both ways. It'll cut, up, cut, up, cut, up. All right, so for this, we're just going to take one pass so it doesn't matter. And we're not going to multiple depths and we are not leaving any stock. And linking, you can leave all that alone for now. All right, so I'm going to click OK. It's going to give us an idea of what it's going to look like. So it looks like it's taken two passes. All right, and it shouldn't need to. So let's go in here and see if we can change that. So right here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change this step over to two inches. Still trying to do it. Yeah, I think we're right there in that kind of weird area where it, where it has to take uh, two passes. No, I can always just say do a three inch step over and it's not, you see, it's just going to shoot the tool right down through the smack middle of it, which is fine, right? Um, and I mean, we can leave it like that, right? But if you came in here and you said that you wanted to do a step over of 10 thou, you know, watch what's going to happen. All right? It takes its first pass, you know, taking full body, and then it takes 10,000 step overs until it gets off the part. And it looks like it's going to take 40 minutes to do that. All right? Obviously, we're not going to do that. We'll just change that back to three inches. Okay. So let's look at that. Come right here. You see where it's leading in? 
And keep in mind, this line is the center of the tool. So as soon as the center of the tool gets off, it's going to ramp up. See that? Now, we don't want it to do that. We want it to go all the way across the part. All right, that's going to look weird. So we're going to go here, and we're going to do some pass extension. Okay? Pass extension and stock offset work very similarly on um, a face mill cycle. So let's see what 1.5 pass extension does. Okay? See it? It just extended it out a little bit. All right. Now let's show you what some of these other options do. And, and you know, guys, the key to learn in this CAD CAM is get something like this built and then just come in here and change one thing and then see what happens and say, oh, okay, that makes sense. All right, and then go back, change that back. So now let's go 90. All right, let's see what that does. Okay. So, you know, when in doubt, change something, see what happens. All right, doesn't cost you anything. And yeah, all right, so, so that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Now, if you wanted to leave some stock, like let's say you wanted to, to leave 10 thousandths, then see that, see how that's not going all the way down. So that's 10 thousandths. I'm going to edit this, go right here, I'm going to turn that off and watch what happens. Now it's dead on it. Okay. All right. Now, normally, when you're doing something like this, <clears throat> you have to regenerate this code. So normally, when you make a change, you have to go in here, right click, and generate code. All right, you're not post-processing none of that stuff. You're just generating the code inside of Fusion. So, <clears throat> excuse me. This face mill cycle is so simple. All right, we're, we're looking at just a couple of lines of code here. It's very, very simple. So it doesn't need me to tell it to regenerate. It just does it itself. Okay. So that face mill cycle is pretty much done. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is come in here and walk around the outside of this part. So we need to do that so that we can flip it over and do these holes so these sides are good and cleaned up, all right? So, I'm gonna come right here, I'm gonna right click, new operation, 2D milling, and we're going to do what's called a 2D adaptive clearing. <clears throat> all right, we don't wanna use the face mill for that. So, I'm gonna go right here to my library, and I'm going to select a flat end mill and I'm just going to say half inch rough. All right? And if you want to use a high speed steel for this, if you want to use a carbide for this, whatever, this is where you specify that stuff. All right. So we're going to use a, uh, a carbide, you know, just for the sake of this, I'm going to do a carbide three flute. My diameter is going to be 0.5. My shaft diameter is going to be the same. Overall length, not really super concerned about that. Length below shoulder, not super concerned about that. <clears throat> shoulder length and flute length. Now, the, these, these are fairly important. Um, now, without having the tool in front of me that I can measure the flute length, <coughs> excuse me, for the sake of this, for the sake of this, we're just gonna call it one inch. All right, we're just gonna say, hey, this is one inch. All right, and I'm going to say my flute length is the same, or my shoulder length is the same, okay? Now, if I had the tool in front of me, I would obviously measure it, and I would get the information off the tube, and I would input all this information. But, again, for the sake of this demo, we're just going to play it safe. All right, shaft, holder, all that stuff's good. Now, <clears throat> let's say we want to cut this at 1,000 surface feet. Let's see where that puts us. 
all right, 7,639 RPM. All right, now let's say that we went to the um, cutting tool manufacturer's website and they recommended uh, 1,500. All right, that's where you input that. Now, notice it went to 11,459 RPM. <clears throat> Our machines won't spin that fast. All right, the super mini mills will not spin that fast. So it's going to max out at 10,000. All right. So if you input something in there that says 11,000 RPM, it's going to try to get there. All right. But it's just going to limit out. It's going to, it's just going to stop at 10,000. All right. Um, so let's just, uh, let's just put this at like 1200 surface feet for now. This is going to be 91. 67 just matching that now let's say we want to cut at four thou per tooth <clears throat> let's say we want to ramp at 50 inches a minute and we want to plunge at two thou per flute now it takes this information here All right, let's see if we can see the expression hopefully it's going to show us the expression and it's not all right so it takes this information this two thou per per flute or per uh revolution and it and it manipulates it like it divides it by a lot okay so i mean you you see look if i set this to four all right you see the difference between these like it, it's a third okay Partially because this is feed per revolution. Well, it's all it's feed per revolution and it's a three flute cutter. Alright. So this is taking into account the flutes. This one is not. Feed per rev, feed per tooth. Okay. So I'm just gonna set this at about two, which is actually, you know, less than one chip load. Okay? And then post processor, I'm gonna say. 0.500 carbide rough 1.0 length of cut minimum okay and accept and we're gonna go right over here <clears throat> all this information is good that's where we selected it earlier now it's asking me for a pocket, all right? We're gonna do like an open pocket, all right? So I'm gonna select this surface, or that, not that surface, that edge. I'm gonna select that top edge right there. I'm not gonna fool with the stock contours rest machine. I'm not gonna fool with any of that. That's, you know, a little bit higher level. Now, heights. It's asking me how far do I want to go down, all right? So, for my bottom height, that's, that's basically how deep am I going. I'm going to go to Selection. I'm going to select that. And then I'm going to go minus one inch. So, it's going to cut down one inch. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to take for granted that everybody is going to cut this away. So, you know, we're, we're, only, we're only trying to square this material up, okay? And then over here, so for my optimal load, that's going to be my radial side load. All right, that, that's how much, can, how much do we want to push this cutter uh, sideways? I'm going to say just keep it simple at like 50 thousandths. I'm not going to click both ways because that's going to climb mill and conventional mill. Um, and sometimes that's okay, but we're, we're just going to stick with um, climb milling only. Okay. And then we're not going to go multiple depths. We want to do this all in one shot. So we're going full depth, but a small radial side load. Okay. And actually I'm going to, Pull an image. I'm gonna pause you real. All right. So I just uh, did a quick Google search for um, this uh, this image here. 
so this image was created by uh, Harvey Tool, and I, I think it's a really good explanation. So the the normal way of doing things, um, you know, looking at it, you know, over the past you know 20, 30 years of machining, a, a lot of milling has been done like this, where you do a lower axial depth of cut ADC and a higher radial depth of cut and what ends up happening is you in, you have to take more passes in the Z so you have to just increase your axial depth of cut as you go and what happens is that wears out the bottom of your cutter all right so your your cutter is getting all of the work done right here but if you look at this one you've got a higher axial depth of cut and a lower radial depth of cut and you spread out the load across the entire cutter or as much of the cutter as you can all right so you end up taking more radial passes but it's a lot easier on tooling it's a lot easier on pretty much everything all right so that, that's just a, a good little good little thought there. So that's that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go full depth, but we're gonna take smaller radial bites. All right, we're gonna leave 20 thousandths radially and zero axially. Okay. And then all of this is pretty good for now. We'll get into that a little bit deeper later. Okay, so that's that's my path right there. All right, so that let's see what we've got right now. Just looking at uh, the simulation. So face mill, and we got that half inch rougher. Okay, and right now we're sitting at one minute and eight seconds. All right, 32 seconds for the face mill, 36 seconds for the, the end mill. All right, so let's go in here and just kind of manipulate some of this stuff just to kind of prove a point. So let's change this to a half, uh, two tenths, all right? Let's say our optimal load is two tenths. Let's see what happens. Right, it's still calculating. Okay, so you see what happened. Kind of pause. My computer's making funny noises. It's uh, that's that's pretty demanding on it when it's when it's got to generate that much, that much stuff. So I'm gonna go back in here and change it back to something normal or something better than that. Let's let's just change it to five just to prove a point. Okay, you see more passes. Okay, so let's go back and change that to a reasonable amount like 50. All right, that's better. So now let's see what happens when we just do uh, like multiple depths. All right, so let's go down a quarter inch per. All right, see, all that's doing is the same thing over and over and over just at different depths. Okay, so we talked about uh, radial step over, so optimal load. All right, then we talked about multiple depths. Now, stock to leave. Watch what happens if I do, watch what happens if I put this at point one for my radial stock to leave. You see, it's only taking one pass now because it's leaving a hundred thousands on these side surfaces. It's gonna leave a hundred here, here, all those side surfaces. All right, we only want that to be 20. So right back to normal. 
and edit here. Now let's see what happens if we leave a half inch axially. All right? It's not going to full depth, right? Let's change it back. Okay, so that's how you leave material, all right? So whenever you're roughing, obviously you want to leave a little bit of material. You don't want to carry it straight to net with a rougher, okay? All right, and that pretty much sums up what we need to know for the adaptive. All right, no, we're not, we're not done yet. We still got holes to drill and finishing and all sorts of stuff, all right? So next thing we're going to do is jump right into finishing this all right now i'm gonna pause it it's not gonna look like a pause from your side but all right so now we are going to finish this face here all these these external surfaces where we roughed them here we're going to finish them now uh pretty pretty easy to do once you have done something once you can duplicate it all right so essentially copy and pasting all right um no this isn't like a great example of it but but you'll you'll see the the functionality of this uh as we get a little bit deeper but i'm gonna first off i'm gonna go ahead and label these um let's say face to net and then Let's say rough outside. I'm gonna go ahead and say one inch deep. Okay, so rough outside to one inch deep. So I'm going to right click and create derived operation. Okay, so create right one we'll do one more do it one more time. Right click. Create derived operation, 2D milling, and then I'm going to go to 2D contour. <clears throat> All right, so a contour, that's just walking around something one time. All right, that's, well, walking around one surface, all right, or one edge, line, whatever you want to call it. Um, you don't have the functionality that you do in like an adaptive. So basically, you've just got a lot of different tools with a lot of different capabilities and you've just got to pick which ones are right um, and we'll be going over all of these uh, in time but facing very common roughing very common like adaptive roughing very common and contour is probably the most common okay so what I did when I duplicated that is I, I pretty much just made a direct copy but instead of it being under the adaptive umbrella it's under the contour umbrella now. So I'm gonna go right here. We need a new tool. All right, we're not gonna be able to reuse that same tool, so we're, we need a finisher. So I'm gonna go here again, right click, flat end mill, and we're just gonna say, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna say a 3 8 because I know we've got a lot of those. Well, I say a lot. We have some. There we go. That's spelled close to correct anyway. All right. So then we're going to go cutter, three flute, carbide, 0.375, 3 eighths cutter. Flute length is going to be one inch. You know, these don't have to match. But, you know, sometimes cutters have reduced necks and things like that. Um, so that, that's where that comes into play. All right, but this, these cutters don't have reduced necks, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. Then we're going to go to cutting data. We're going to spin this at 1,200 surface feet. All right, and you see that put us at higher than 10,000, so we're just going to do 1,000 surface feet. All right, I'll tell you what, let's just forget about this and just go 10,000. All right. All right, and 
Probably want to feed about three thou per flute. All right, probably do a 50 on the ramp feed rate. And uh, let's just say 50 on the plunge feed rate as well. All right, post processor. This is going to be 375 finish. One inch length of cut minimum. I keep doing that. Minimum. There we go. And accept. Select that tool. All right. Now, being that I duplicated this, it has already selected that top contour, which is what I selected here as well. All right, so we don't have to do that. My heights, it remembered the height that I went one inch deep. Don't have to change anything there. All right, now, this right here, this is, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna talk on this tab right here for a little bit. All right, so your tolerance, this really comes into play if you've got some circular features. I know we talked about this a little bit with the face mill, but it really comes into play on contours when you're doing, you know, curved surfaces and splines and, um, you know, organic shapes and things like that. All right, um, sideways compensation, it's asking you if you want to climb mill or conventional mill, all right? On CNC equipment, we almost always want to climb mill. All right, compensation type. Now, this one is a biggie. All right, so you got four selections. You can either go in computer. So tool compensation is calculated automatically by the program based on a selected tool diameter. The post-processed output contains the compensated path directly instead of G41 or 42 codes. So you don't have to do anything, okay? All you have to do is load the correct tool and go, all right? Now, that sounds great, but if your part comes in big or small, you have nowhere to change it. You have to go back and repost new code, all right? So it sounds great, using in computer, but it has its limitations. Now, if you're working on a part that has a plus or minus 10,000 tolerance that you're trying to hit, all right, in computer's fine. As long as you um, set your tool up right in the tool library, then you're gonna be just fine if you've got a 10,000 tolerance. Anything tighter than that, I would recommend to do in control or, <clears throat> all right, I say in control, tool compensation is not calculated, but rather G41, G42 codes are output to allow the operator to set the compensation amount and wear on the machine control. So this is one where the operator is going to have to input the actual diameter of the tool, okay? Now, you've got wear and inverse wear and they're very, very similar. So wear works as if in computer was selected. So it works as if compensation was zero, but it also outputs 41 and 42 codes. So if the part comes in big or small, then the operator can just adjust like instead of changing the tool diameter from 0.375 to 0.374, the operator would just put input negative one thousandths. Okay. Um, so I think for the beginning stages of what we're doing here, we need to stick with in computer and just remember to comp it. Okay. All right, I'm going to show you a little trick to, to remind you. All right. Um, so minimum cutting radius and finish smoothing deviation. We don't have to worry about any of that right now. All right, but multiple finish passes. All right, this, this is pretty cool. And I'm just gonna show you, I'm just gonna set this to 10, just to kinda show you. Let's do 10 finishing passes. And I know that sounds like a lot, but watch. Each one of these lines one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Each one of those lines are, uh, what was it, ten thousandths apart? 
All right? So let's change that to five. So basically what it does is it gradually works in. It doesn't just go straight to the number. All right? Um, this works great if, let's say, that your rougher, you know, maybe you were using a regrind as a rougher and it wasn't dead on size. All right, then you can creep into this without your first finish pass taking a boatload of material. All right. Um, normally, I don't do multiple finish passes. Um, you know, unless it's unless it's something where we are using like a, a potentially reground rougher or something. All right. What I do is repeat finish pass. All right. And what that does is it walks around the same profile twice. It's essentially a flex pass. And I wish I could change that verbiage right there to flex pass. All right? Um, so what I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and look at the code. I'm just gonna click OK. And normally I would need to go in there and click generate. Let me find. Alright, so right here. What you're looking at here is the point at which it ramps in is the exact same point that it ramps out. So it ramps in, and then as soon as it gets to that same point, it ramps out again. Now, if you've got repeat finish pass turned on, that's not a, a huge deal, right? But I always like to have a little bit of an overlap. All right, so let's just see what point one, two, five does. You see now it's overshooting it a little bit. Okay. All right. Now, also, once you see this extension here, that, that straight line right there, I'll show you where you change that. So, I'm just going to hover over that, and I'm going to change this to 0.5 just carry it to extremes to show you so that's what that does okay and then so I think that was at 0.0375 originally now I'm just kind of hitting the high points I'm not going to go into like huge detail about all of these um, but it, you know you can always just hover over them and it will tell you exactly what it does. All right, it's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good with that in that respect. All right. Now, if you wanted to enter at a certain location, you can always click entry position and click where you would like to enter. All right. So. You see it is entering right there at that point that I clicked on okay and you you can set that wherever you know if you if you want to uh, if you want to set that you know on this end whatever wherever you want to put it all right now I will tell you that that when you're uh, when you're ramping on, uh, sometimes you will end up with a little bit of a line, like a little bit of an imperfection. So, uh, you know, you may want to do, you may want to put some effort into trying to conceal that, trying to hide that. Um, you know, if you've got a surface that's going to be shown that everybody's going to see, you may want to uh, try to put this on the back side of that. All right. So that's contour. Okay. So I'm going to come right here. And I'm going to say finish, and I had it right. All right, and I'm going to write comp me exclamation points. Okay, so what that's going to tell me is when I am putting this job in the machine, when I upload this, this code to the machine, um, you know, to the, to the CNC machine, that when I'm scrolling through the code, that is going to jump out to me. That's going to say, oh yeah, I need to add comp to that. Because if you don't, it's going to cut your part three-eighths too small. 
and that 3 8 end mill is going to go in and cut you know half body you know it's going to cut half of the diameter of the cutter all the way around the part okay some of y'all may have experienced that before um, with some of this posted code y'all are running um, so just make sure that you add comp when you need comp okay all right, the next thing we've got to do is the holes, all right? Now, one thing that I'm going to um, go ahead and, and add in here just, just to kind of show you guys a little bit of a trick, all right? I'm, I'm a big fan of chamfering these edges in the machine, all right? It takes a little bit of time, but I think it's well worth it. So what we're going to do is we're going to create... A derived operation of this 2d milling 2d contour we're going to select a new tool same thing we've been doing All right, except now it's going to be a chamfer mill and I'm just going to say quarter inch drill mill All right, chamfer mill it's going to be a two flute my diameter is 250 All right now my tip diameter when you look at this right there for the chamfer mills that we have here I put them on the optical comparator and measured this and it's right around 20 thousandths all right overall length all that stuff doesn't really matter for what we're doing 45 degrees is definitely something that needs to be right change that to carbide Okay, all this is good. We're going to cut this on at 10,000 RPM. Okay, and cutting feed rate, we'll just say 100 inches a minute, whatever. That, see I had, I had a thousand by accident. And when I looked at the feed per tooth, it was telling me it was close to 50 thou per tooth, which kind of triggered me to look back at that. All right, 100 inches a minute is about 5 thou per tooth. All right, and change this to 50. Change this to 50. Post processor, 250 drill mill. And accept. Select, come right here. That's already selected for me. And I'm going to get rid of this. I'm just gonna say, you can pick any of these. I'm just gonna say model top, okay? Get rid of that. Passes. Now, it knows that I selected, oh, and hang on, I'm gonna turn off repeat finish pass. There's no need, no need for us to do a finish pass. Uh, uh, flex pass with this tool all right but it knows that i picked the chamfer tool so it's given me this option so i'm going to say that i want a ten thousandths chamfer and if you hover over this i thought it was going to be yeah there we go all right so the chamfer tip offset that is going to basically select where on the tool it's going to cut all right so I'm going to set this to about 50. That's always been kind of my go-to is set that to about 50. And then all of this stuff is good. No need to change any of that. I'm going to get rid of that. All right. So let's run that on the graphics and see what that looks like. Okay, put us a nice little chamfer there. Now, whenever you're looking at this, you see, you can kind of see a chamfer a little bit, but I've still got the model poking through. You can simply turn off the model just by clicking that little eye, all right? Then turn it back on. Now, a lot of people, when you turn that off and then you close, they go, oh my God, where'd it go? 
it's still there you just got to turn it on okay so <clears throat> let's change the name of this oh let me show you what that chamfer tip offset does I remember now so if you can kind of see where that blue line is in relation to the, the top of the part and I'm, I'm gonna so there it is I'm not gonna change the view or anything I'm just gonna go right here I'm gonna change the chamfer tip offset to five and you see how I brought it up significantly so if you've got a chamfer tool that you've been running at like this at this depth for a thousand parts and you want to conserve that tool you can always just come in here change that to like 45 whatever and you now you're using a new part of the tool so it spaces it off like comp and carries it deeper all right uh, pretty pretty simple concept um, not really a whole lot to it just don't overthink it all right so our part is face milled roughed finished deburred now we just need to punch these holes okay so we go up here i'm gonna gonna go new operation i i'm not doing derived operation anymore because i don't have anything that i can kind of copy and paste all right not for the holes anyway so i'm gonna go new operation drilling drill all right, I'm going to select a new tool, except now we are going to go with a spot drill. I'm just going to say um, a 250 spot, the ones we have here, high speed steel, it's a two flute, 250, and the ones we have here are 120 degrees. And the tip diameter, I can't say that I've ever measured one, um, but I'm just going to take a stab at it and say it's somewhere around 30, 30 thousandths. Okay. And about 350 surface feet is probably good for high speed steel. Probably want to feed about 3 thou per tooth. Okay. So. And, and you know if you if you ever get confused I mean don't don't forget you know how to do this math okay it's not like it's you know insanely complicated math all right if, if you get confused with what some of this is you can always do the math yourself all right so feed per tooth at 5348 that's what that equals inches per minute all right so if you take um, I'm not going to pull it up on the calculator here. I'm just going to punch it in my phone. 3,000 per tooth times two teeth times 5348, 32.08 inches per minute. Okay. So uh, now that's not really going to come into play because that's for like side milling. All right. But this is what's going to come into play. Now I want you to I want you to notice something. If I type in three thou per rev, this is exactly half of that because this is in feed per revolution. This is in feed per tooth. Okay, so three thou per rev gives us this feed rate. Post processor quarter inch spot drill accept select and now we just need to select our holes now this is a pretty cool little feature on fusion it has a select same diameter all right so if you select same diameter it will grab all the holes that are that same size all right but i want you to watch something so
whole faces, I'm going to select that upper edge. Well, hey, it worked. It used to not work. It used to make you select the face. All right, so they fixed that. They fixed that bug evidently in this last update. All right, so when you select same diameter, it grabs all of them in that same range. All right, and then I'm going to go heights. My bottom height is going to be from whole top. And I'm just going to say negative 50. Right, I'm going to scroll in here and see what that looks like. You see how it's going to be breaking that edge a little bit? All right? That may be what you want. All right? It's not what I want, but I'm going to change that to about 30. All I'm looking for is a little bitty spot there. All right, 30 thousandths, that's good. And then for my cycle, um, you can always do like a deep drilling. All right, deep drilling is going to be like an 83, like a G83. Yeah, here, I forgot this is up here. So if you just hover over that, if you see that deep drilling, it is the fourth one down, uh, known as peck drilling, G83. All right, but all we need to do for spot drilling is just normal drilling. Okay? And then okay. All right, I'm going to rename this. I'm going to say spot ring locations. Okay, kind of tripping me out. It's not giving me a uh, time here. Let's run it on a simulation. See if that populates. Evidently, it is so fast that it can't pick it up. I don't know why. That should read something, but oh well. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is create a derived operation from this for the 632 tap holes. All right. I don't. I don't want to spot drill, drill, ream these, and then spot drill, drill, tap these. I want to spot drill everything I can, then drill everything I can. All right, now I want to minimize tool changes basically. So create derived operation, drilling, drill. I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to select this face here. Notice I did not pick up inside of the threads. I picked on that flat area. All right, go here. Now these holes are smaller, so we're probably not gonna be able to go as deep. So I'm gonna say negative 20. That will be just fine. And it looks like it's not centered just because of the way that hole is shaped. All right, you see how it's not perfectly circular. That's all that is. All right. And okay. Okay. So next thing we're going to do is probably drill these. So I'm going to right here, create derived operation, drilling, drill. I'm going to go to a new tool. Now, this is a 3 16 ringed hole. So I'm going to go to my drill chart. I'm going to pull that up real quick. And I'm hoping that the image quality is going to be good enough for you to be able to see this. But um, the 3 16 is right here on this drill chart. All right. So I'm going to want to drill, you know, obviously a little bit undersized. Um, so I'm going to say somewhere around 180. And that's going to be a number 15 drill. And that's going to be 180 thousandths. So I'm going to say 
number 15 drill 180 diameter cutter drill it's going to be a two flute diameter is going to be 180 drill point is going to be 118 and the length none of that really matters right now okay I'm we'll probably want to spend this about 300 and probably want to feed it around uh, 3 thou per rev. Okay. Retract feed rate, I'm not super concerned about that. That's just how fast it's going to come back up out of the hole. All right. So this is going to be a, I have forgot, number 15. Number 15, drill, 0.180 diameter, and accept, select, okay, now, all that looks good, now for my heights, instead of selecting the bottom height, I'm going to let it go to whole bottom. And do a zero offset so just to make sure I'm gonna zoom in here it doesn't look like it's going quite to the bottom so let's see what happens all right so now this is calculating the drill point so without that it is not calculating the drill point so with that, it calculates the drill point. And then cycle. So for this one, we'll do a G70, I'm sorry, G83. And uh, for the pecking depth, I'm just going to go 180 divided by 3. So the diameter of the drill divided by 3. Whoops. So it did that math for me and all that looks good so now she's drilled okay so now we can go ahead and drill these other holes if we want or we can go ahead and ream these i say we just go ahead and ream these create derived operation drilling drill in case you haven't noticed drilling holes is a lot of repetitive just going through the motions over and over but once you have your tool library built and all that good stuff it's a good bit easier i think we are reaming these 188 and a half yep and i don't know i'm just going to take a stab at it and say it's a six flute I'm going to cut this probably about, I want to say 60 surface feet. I'm going to feed this probably about 10 thou per rev. So spinning slow, feeding fast, just like we do with reamers. And 188.5 reamer. Okay. So this should just seem like old hat to you. All right, now for this one, I'm not going to include the drill tip through the bottom. And I'm going to do an offset of about 20. So obviously we cannot ream to the same depth that we drilled. Otherwise, we are going to bottom out that reamer inside the hole and tear a lot of stuff up. So make sure you deselect that and make sure you do a positive offset. So watch what happens when I carry that back to zero. But we do not want the ring we're going to the same depth. All right. And for this, if you want to do, a, it's called a counter boring cycle. It's basic, it, it's a G82 and it's going to have a P value. And that P value is how long is it going to dwell. 
all right and I'm just gonna let it dwell for a half a second so it's gonna output a P500 or a P.5 all right so now that's ringed okay so now we need to drill and tap these so let's go back here and for a 632 you know what More than likely, we're going to be using a roll form tap for this. Um, so the, the thread is going to, the tap is going to look like this as opposed to so it's going to look like this as opposed to this and it's not going to make a chip. Okay. It's going to uh, go in and basically compress the material in the shape of this thread. All right. Now, you cannot drill them the same. You have to drill them differently. All right. Now, I've got a tap drill chart that I have used for years and years. I'm looking for a copy of it. Uh, not seeing it. But any of these should work. All right, that's STI, that's for helicoils. You do not want that. I'm gonna pause it and pull something up. So I just consulted my chart that I've got um, and it's telling me 125 thousandths drill for a 632 roll form tap um, or a form, just a form tap, whatever you wanna call it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is make some copies of this chart and I'll put it out on the shop for, for everybody to grab. Um, just make sure you don't confuse um, the, the tap drill sizes for cutting taps versus form taps. All right, so we need 125 thousandths drill for these. Let me go ahead and rename these. Okay, so I'm gonna create a derived operation here. Drilling, drill. I'm gonna select a new tool. You know, it's a smaller drill, so we'll feed it a little bit slower. Okay. And accept. And I'm just kind of speeding through this because we've done it so many times. Same process. All right. So all that's good. Now my heights, I need to go hold bottom. And then I need to add for the drill tip. And just kind of take a look and make sure all that looks good. And it looks like it does. Actually, it looks like it's going a little deeper than... Oh, uh, because I got this in there. So that looks perfect. And then cycle. For this one, we will do a G83. And we need to go 0.125 divided by 3. I keep hitting enter and I shouldn't. So that's good. And the reason I'm doing uh, the diameter divided by a third, I, I've always just, uh, when, I'm, when I'm peck drilling, I normally go the diameter of the drill divided by 3 per peck. So a third of the diameter per peck. All right. All that looks good. And then so I'm going to say drill tap locations. So 
So now we just need to tap them. Right hand to tap. We'll say one fluke if that if that matters. Don't think it does. So the diameter of a 632. Do that math real quick. Hundred and thirty eight thousandths. And my thread pitch is going to be one divided by thirty two. All right. Now for this, for my spindle speed, I'm going to do six hundred and forty RPM. Now, any time that you tap. Um, your your speeds and feeds have to be excuse me excuse me your speeds and feeds have to be in a ratio all right now if that ratio is broken you are not going to have a good tapped hole now um, I do 600 I do basically divisions of the TPI all right, so 640 is 20 times the TPI. All right, so I could have done 320, and that would be 10 times the TPI. All right, I could have done 32, and that would be 1 times the TPI. All right, but I'm choosing 640 so that it will feed at a nice, even 20 inches a minute. All right, um, now I don't want to get into a whole lot of detail about that because this is a CAD CAM class. Um, but it's, uh, it's definitely something that, that we cover in, uh, in machining in the, uh, in the normal, you know, machine shop classes. All right. So, uh, right here, this is a 632 form tap and accept. Okay. All that's good. I'm going to deselect that and then I'm going to go positive about 30 okay so just uh give myself a little more room you know if you want to go 20 or something that's fine but just make sure i wouldn't go any less than 20 okay and then this is going to be right hand tapping then okay all right and that's that's pretty much it. All right. Um, no, I would normally go into, you know, I would chamfer these. Um, I would probably um, maybe carry that spot a little bit deeper to clean these holes up. Um, it's hard to do that with a chamfer mill because the way this is modeled, it's not circular and it looks weird. So, it, it, and it gives you a weird looking deburn cycle um but that would be real easy to do and look we can uh we can do that i'll tell you what we'll go ahead and do it and this is a good opportunity to show you something i'm going to select that and then that and then okay all right it did not do it let's see what my alarm is contour was not machined because of a uh, given lead parameters would cause a collision so you see how far it's ramping in it doesn't like that inside that small hole so we can change that simply by going here and changing this to you know, five thousandths. So now it's doing it. Okay. Looks, looks great. So let me change this. All 
right, so let's run it on the graphics. I want you to see something. Some of y'all probably know what's getting ready to happen, but. All right, so roughing, finishing, deburring. Now, it deburred that spot. Whoa, that's some crazy, crazy reflections going on here. All right, so it tried to chamfer that spot before the hole was there. So that means we need to either get rid of that or reorder it. If we want to reorder it, just grab it and drop it back there at the bottom. So now, there we go. Let's turn off the model, take a look at it. Looks good. Okay. All right, now, if you want to, you can always come in and do like a comparison and look and make sure that your model looks good. Like make sure you, you didn't leave a lot of extra material on something. Um, so you see how that's showing up blue? Because there's material there and it shouldn't be. All right, but let's look at why. Because there's supposed to be a tapped hole there. All right. So it's telling you there's still material there, even when we haven't got to that operation. Just be careful with this because if, hang on, because this is really demanding on a computer, like on the processor and graphics card and everything else. So make sure you either leave that on material or operation or tool, whatever you want to leave it on. But just do not leave it on comparison. Alright, so looks like 4 minute and 8 second runtime. And everything looks good to me. Alright, so the next thing we would do is post process this. Once we have established this is good, now we need to convert this over to the Haas language. Alright, going to right click and you, you can do this couple of ways. You can either go up here or you can go here and post process. All right, now, and this popped up on my other screen. I'm just dragging it over here. All right, you remember where we typed in 14301? Remember where we typed all that in? That's auto-populated. Now, on my machine, being that I post code from this computer, um, it remembers that I like to use the Haas pre next gen control. You are going to have to change this. So you're going to have to come up here. You're going to have to drop this down and grab the Haas pre next gen control. Right here. Even if you're on a next gen machine, and even if you're on a machine that has a next gen control, you just, we use this, this post processor. All right. Um, one of the things that I do is I get rid of preload tool unless you're on a machine that has a side mount tool changer. Okay. So you would need to get rid of that, turn off preload tool. Okay. G187. I like turning that on. It helps reduce the size of the programs by um, only increasing the precision when needed. And I get rid of sequence numbers, right? I know I talked about this in the last video, but the sequence numbers just eat up a lot of memory uh, in the machines. And then I normally turn in, you know, change that uh, built-in tolerance uh, to five tenths, okay? Once you get that, you're gonna go post, all right? And then this is where I always add in the O and save. All right. 
we're just waiting because Autodesk has a product that's very similar to Simco. It's called Visual Studio Code. And there is my GNM code. All right, there's the notes that I put in there, face to net, rough outside, one inch deep, all those notes and things that I put in there. All right, everybody always seems curious about this, not sure why, but that's 610 lines of code. Okay. So from here, you would just go file, save as, and put this .nc program wherever you would want to put it. Put it on your flash drive, put it on your desktop for later, wherever you want to put it, this is where you would put your code. Okay. So that is how you cam this part. All right. Really simple, but it's got all the concepts of a complicated part. Okay. So, you know, so what that this part was rectangular in shape and flat. All right. The concepts are the same. All right. It, it doesn't take any more mouse clicks to do a complicated part than it does a simple part. All right. Um, so what your assignment is going to be is to draw this part and put the cam to this part. Okay. So you're going to do everything that we just did. All right. You can follow along step by step, however you want to do it. Um, I, I, I would encourage you to watch the video and then attempt it on your own and then come back to the video for, um, you know, help. All right. I, I wouldn't want you just sitting there mindlessly just doing, just matching what I'm doing. All right. And then you are going to submit your posted code. So you're going to submit that file on Canvas for the grade. All right. So. That is the video. That is uh, the, the cam for this. Obviously, the CAD was in a separate video. Um, the next video that we do like this is going to be a little bit faster paced. Um, I'm not going to go into as much detail about everything, um, you know, just, just to kind of, that, that's the progression, right? Um, so we're not going to be repeating a lot of the simpler concepts over and over. We're going to uh, move on to new content, right? So there it is, uh, aluminum derby car. Um, CAD was done, CAM was done, and then um, the next one will probably do these side holes just as a quick little, little setup um, just to kind of show you that real quick. That won't take long at all. And uh, we've actually got all of our tools and stuff already in, a, in, the, um, in the tool crib. So we should be good to go. We'll catch you on the next one.